For the Chapter 2 review, here's question 1. Many professional schools require applicants to take a standardized test. Suppose that 1,000 students take such a test. Several weeks after the test, Pete receives his score report. He got a 63, which placed him at the 73rd percentile. This means what? All you need to do is apply the definition of percentile, and in this case, the correct answer is letter E. What your percentile is, is uh, the percent of people you did better than, basically. Be careful here, 63 is his raw score, it's not a percentile, uh, therefore it can't be B. Um, Pete's score the me was not below the median, the median is the 50th percentile, he's clearly above that at the 73rd percent. Uh, if we were to look at a standard normal curve with that, uh, the 50th percentile is there. If he's at the 73rd, uh, that would mean that there's 73% of the curve is below Pete's score. Question two, for the normal distribution shown, the standard deviation is closest to which number? What you want to remember is that in a standard normal curve, um, we look at z-scores. And right here, this would be the z-score of zero, right at the middle uh, where the mean resides. Uh, typically, you're going to find it go to a positive 3z-score to a negative 3z-score. Now, if we look at that, if we count how many standard deviations that would be in terms of z-scores, what you're going to find is you're going to have one, two, three in that direction and three in this direction. So in total, what you're seeing here is there's six standard deviations in the full length of this number line. Well, the number line goes from, we have at this point is a negative eight, and from here we have a positive 12. Uh, the complete distance between that is 20 units. So if you take 20 and you divide it into six standard deviations, you're gonna get approximately 3.3 standard deviations. Uh, based on that, 3.3 is gonna be closest to four. And 4 would make better sense than exactly 3.3 because it's not exactly three complete standard deviations. It can have this tail go really, really skinny still, and you're going to go just a little bit more. So there could be just a bit more on this side and a bit more on this side. So, again, it's not exactly 3 to negative 3. It's going to pull out even just a little bit more. But it really materially doesn't end up making that much of a difference. Question 3. Rainwater was collected in water containers at 30 different sites near an industrial complex, and the amount of acidity, which is the pH level, was measured. The mean and standard deviation uh, of the values are 4.60 and 1.130, uh, respectively. When the pH meter was recalibrated back to, at the laboratory, it, it was found to be an error. The error can be cal uh, corrected by adding 0.1 pH units to all of the values and then multiplying that result by 1.2. The mean and standard deviation of the correct pH measurements are what? Again, let's jot down uh, the original mean that got was 4.60. The standard deviation was 1.10. Uh, the type of transformation they need to do, it le looks like they need to take uh, the original data. They need to add back a 0 0.1, and then they need to multiply right, if we uh, do a multiplication by 1.2. So what you need to remember is in terms of measures of center, which is the mean, and measures of spread, which is standard deviation, how do they get impacted when you add data back and when you multiply it? Uh, in this case, the, the mean, I'm gonna call it the mean new, you need to take that, which was the 4.60, and it says here they want to correct it, they want to add back the 0.1 first and then multiply it by 1.2. So the order here is important. So let's take this value, we're going to add the 0.01 back to it, then we multiply it by 2. Uh, because measures of center are impacted both by adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Whereas the measure of spread, which is our sigma in this case, I'm just call it sigma nu, um, we're going to take the original of 1.10. Uh, this is only impacted by multiplication and division, so let's take that and multiply it by 1.2. When you do that, the new mean and standard deviation is going to be letter B. This is a real important concept to remember because we use this from now all the way to the end of the book into chapter 12. Uh, so measures of center, again, are transformed. Um, they're impacted by add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Uh, standard deviations are spread, just multiplication and division. 
Number four, the figure shows a cumulative relative frequency graph of the number of ounces of alcohol consumed per week in a sample of 150 adults. About what percent of these adults consume between four and eight ounces per week? So first thing to remember, uh, relative frequency is percentage. Cumulative relative frequency is like a running total of percents. So you're going to notice this graph, it never dives back down. A cumulative graph can never, ever dive back down. It can only continue to grow. Now to answer the question, what percent was between 4 and 8, I'm just going to come on in here. Here's our 4 ounces, and here's our 8 ounces. Um, if we look at this graph, it looks like the 4 was roughly below 20%. And it looks like at 8 ounces was roughly going to hit at 60%. So the increase in the range here from 20 to 60 is going to be about a 40% increase. Therefore, the answer here is going to be letter B. Number five, the average yearly snowfall in Chileville is normally distributed with a mean of 55 inches. If the snowfall in Chileville exceeds 60 inches in 15% of the years, what is the standard deviation? Well, first thing I'm going to do is actually just do a rough sketch of this standard normal curve. So here we have our curve. And they're telling us the mean of this curve is 55. So it's going to be right down the middle. This is where we have 55 inches. Now, uh, if the snowfall exceeds 60 inches, so let me tack that onto the graph. And I'm just going to put 60 right here. If it exceeds 60, then that's in 15% of the years. So this is what we have in terms of our graph. They want to know what's the standard deviation. Well, these are this is the raw data, by the way. And our raw data, we can compute it to a z-score if we wanted it to. What we could do is recall that the z-score is going to be um, our piece of data minus the mean over the standard deviation. So what we know here is a few things. We already know um, that the mean is 55, so I'm just going to rewrite this formula. Uh, the mean is 55, our piece of data is 60, we don't know the standard deviation. But can we get the z-score at a 60 uh, inches of snowfall? Sure, we can do that, we can compute the z-score. What we want to do is we know the area under the curve here is 0.85. So if we can go backwards on this, we could do an inverse norm to find out what the z-score is at 60 inches. And on my calculator, what I would do is on inverse norm, I'm just going to do inverse norm um, at 85%, and I want 0 and 1. If you do that, what you're going to get is it's 1.03. So that is the z-score that we would get at those inches. Therefore, I can go back up to my z-score formula, and I could actually do put the z-score in there. Um, to solve this, I'm just going to do some quick multi uh, cross-multiplication on this. Um, you know, I'm going to bring my standard deviation up there and bring this back down. Um, so when we write this one out, what we're going to get is that sigma uh, is going to be equal to 60 minus 55 is 5. Let's take that and divide it by 1.03. Therefore, the standard deviation that we get from this calculation is roughly, uh, I think I got 4.85. So we're going to say for this, it's letter A. The thing to take away from this problem is to remember when we know the area under the curve and we want to find any of its values, that's when you use the inverse norm. Um, if you wanted to... Uh, find the area under the curve, but you knew the values, that's when you would do the normal CDF. One very important feature is uh, the reason we could actually use inverse norm in this case is because we were told the distribution is normal. Therefore, we are allowed to use that inverse norm. And it looks like here I forgot the little n under my uh, inverse norm calculation. Number six, the figure shown is the density curve of a distribution. Five of the seven points marked on the density curve make up the five-number summary for this distribution. Which two points are not a part of that five-number summary? First thing we need to recall, what is the five-number summary? Uh, remember, it's going to be our min, Q1, our median, Q3, and then the max. So I think from here we can de de decide that finding the... Um, 
minimum and the maximum are going to be pretty straightforward. So uh, we know that the minimum is A and then the maximum would be G. So anything with A and G clearly cannot be an answer because that is part of the five number summary. Um, now your next question would be where is the median? Or maybe it's easier for you to find Q1 or Q3. So maybe just remember the definition, right? The median is the 50th percentile, Q3 is the 75th percentile, Q1 is the 25th percentile. And sometimes it's almost easier to eliminate some from here. Uh, if you look at letter F, if F was Q3, that would mean 25% of the data would actually sit in just this little bar. And I think you can all agree that is not 25% um, of the data, so it definitely cannot be Q3. Therefore, letter F would have to be one of our choices. So it's either going to be this guy or this guy, which means we can cross off A and C. Because again, we're finding the ones that, that don't work. Um, so now the next question we know F doesn't work. Um, maybe it's almost easier now to look at, you know, the Q1. Do we think Q1 would have to be, if we break this down, letter B or letter C? And those are the two choices that are left. Um, if it was C, this whole curve right here would represent 25% of, uh, of the data. If it was B, this would represent 25% of the data. Again, I think on here we can agree that B does not make sense Therefore, careful the question, B is the right one because we want it not to be part of the five number summary. So the final answer here is letter D on the multiple choice. So if they had asked, basically what we can say is we're going to call this one Q1, uh, letter D is our median, and then E is going to be Q3. Number seven, the heights of American men follow a normal distribution, and 99.7% have heights between five feet and seven feet. What is your estimate of the standard deviation of the height of American men? Now, the normal distribution, again, just having that word in there is huge. So that allows me to come on in here and sketch a standard normal curve. What we know, 99.7% um, is captured between five feet and seven feet. Remember, 99.7% is three standard deviations from the mean. So I'm going to actually sketch the mean in here, that's our mu, and we know one, two, three standard deviations in both directions. So what this would be, on the low end, this is my five feet, and on the high end, that's my seven feet. So this area under the curve is 99.7%. Uh, what is the estimate of our standard deviation? Well, we can back into some numbers on this curve. Uh, if you take a look at it, uh, what's the middle between 5 and 7 would be 6. So therefore, we know the mean is 6 feet. Now, we know that within this range here, we have to go 1, 2, 3 spaces. So to go between 5 and between 6 is 1 complete foot. Well, 1 complete foot, uh, clearly we're probably going to have to go into some inches, right? This is going to be 12 inches. Well, you have to divvy that up into three different sectors, this, this, and this. So let's just take 12 divided by 3, which would make sense that the standard deviation is about 4 inches uh, for both of the directions. Question 8. Which of the following is not correct about the standard normal distribution? You know, again, if it helps you, make a sketch of that curve. And what I'm going to do is if I look at these answers, you're going to notice they're all talking about z-scores. So let me just do the curve with some z-scores, which would get us something looking like this curve. Um, and we want to know which one is not correct. So let's just go through it and see what happens. Uh, part A, the proportion of scores that satisfies 0 to 1.5 is 0.4332. So what they're saying here is if we had between 0 and 1.5 here is that 43.32% of the curve. Folks, all you need to do is you can just use normal CDF and make this really easy. So let's just do a normal CDF. Um, our lower bound and our upper bound, so from 0 to 1.5. And these are z-scores they're using, so the mean of a z-score is 0. The standard deviation of your z-scores is 1. So let's just do 0 and 1. 
And if you punch that in your calculator, you are going to get the answer that's shown here. So A is a correct. It is not a false answer. Let's test letter B. The proportion of scores that satisfy Z is less than negative 1.0 is about 15.87%. So here we're talking about uh, negative 1. They want to know beneath here. Fine, let's just go in and adjust the normal CDF. Our lower bound in this case, I'm going to put infinity or something uh, really big. How about negative 999? And then we're going to change this to negative 1. If you do that, we will get that score. So B is not the wrong answer. Uh, next one, we want the Z-score is greater than 2. Uh, to find the Z-score greater than 2, we're just going to go up here and go everything higher. So we can adjust this normal CDF language. What I would put in the calculator now is from 2 to a positive 999 or something large and 0 and 1. Again, you're going to find this answer works, so we're going to cross that one off. Let's look at letter D. The proportion of scores that satisfy Z is less than 1.5 is 0.9332, so about 93%. So if we look at that curve, uh, 1.5 is here, and we're going to go everything all the way down in this black. So let's just do our normal CDF of negative 999, uh, 1.5, 0, and 1. And when you do that, Again, you're going to get this answer, so that's not the incorrect one. Ultimately, for a time test, I could just circle E, but let's just think about it logically, too. E is here we need the z-score greater than negative 1.3, so we are basically just going to be looking at from this negative 3 all the way up. Let's adjust our calculation, and we would just write what negative 3 to positive 999 uh, 0 and 1, and when you do that, we actually get the answer to be 0.9986, so this is a little bit low, and it is the wrong answer. Question 9 and 10 go together. Uh, here it says, um, until the scale was changed in the 1995, SAT scores were based on a scale set many years ago. For math scores, the mean under the old scale in the 1990s was 470 and the standard deviation of 110. In 2009, the mean was 515 and standard deviation was 116. So I'm going to jot those statistics down real quick. So this here is basically what they've said. I've used the 90 for 1990 and the 09 for 2009. Uh, question 9 is, what is the standardized score for the student who got 500 on the old ACT scale? Well, all we need to do for that is compute the Z-score. Uh, so let's do the z-score is the person's score of 500. And they want us to use the old scale, so we're just going to do the 470 minus the 110. And that's easy enough. When you do that, you are going to get a z-score of 0.27. Number 10. Jane took the SAT in 1994 and scored 500. Her sister Colleen took the SAT in 2009 and scored 530. Who did better and how can you tell? Well, here all we have to do is compute the two separate z-scores. So we'll do the z-score for Jane, do a j. Uh, she got a 500. Uh, the mean and standard deviation in, um, back in 1994 would mean she had to use the old scale because it didn't change until 1995. So we'll do her 500. Um, we're going to do this minus the 470 over 110. And we know on this one, from the previous question, the z-score was 0.27. Now let's come on in and recalculate it now for Colleen this time. So the z-score for Colleen, she got a 530, but she's under the new testing of a 515 mean and a 116 standard deviation, and that's going to get her a 0.13. So who did better? Uh, clearly... Um, Jane still did better because she has 0.27 standard deviations above the mean, whereas Colleen is only 0.13 standard deviations above the mean. And that would give us letter C is the correct answer. Now let's look at the free response. Here's number 11. As part of the President's Challenge, students can attempt to earn the Presidential Physical Fitness Award or the National Physical Fitness Award by meeting qualifying standards in five events. Curl-ups, shuttle run, sit and reach, one mile run, and pull-ups. The qualifying standards are based on the 1985 uh, School Population Fitness Survey. 
For the presidential award, the standard for each event is the 85th percentile of the results for a specific age group and gender among students who participated in the 1985 survey. For the national award, the standard is the 50th percentile. To win either award, a student must meet the qualifying standards for all five events. Jean, who is nine years old, did 40 curl-ups in one minute. Matt, who is 12 years old, also did 40 curl-ups in one minute. The qualifying standards for the presidential award is 39 curl-ups for Jane and 50 curl-ups for Matt. The national standards are 30 and 40 respectively. Question A. Compare Jane's and Matt's performance using percentiles. Explain in language simple enough for someone who knows little statistics to understand. So if we look at this, for the presidential award, we need the 85th percentile. For the national award, we need the 50th percentile. Now, for that presidential award, it says here, Jane had to do 39 curl-ups. She did 40. And then Matt had to do 50 curl-ups, and he did 40. So just based on that information alone, who did better? What you could say here is that Jane was required to get at least 39 curl-ups for the presidential award, which is the 85th percentile, and she got 40. So what we know is that Jane is at, as at least the 85th percentile. Okay. Whereas, if we look at Matt, he needed to get 50 curl-ups, but he only did 40. So what we know for sure is that Matt did not meet the presidential award. Okay. Well, the national award, Matt, for respectively, would have to have gotten 40, and he did get 40. So we know that Matt is at the 50th percentile. So that's where we know that they're, they're sitting. Based on that, who did better? What you would want to do is just explain what percentile means. The definition of percentile is, for example, Jane has 85% of the people underneath her who did worse than her. Matt's definition of per percentile is there are 50% of the participants did worse than Matt. So clearly based on this, we could conclude that Jane did better. Part B, who has the higher standard value z-score, Jane or Matt, justify your answer? Now remember to calculate a z-score, what we would want technically is we would want to do the piece of data, so maybe Jane or Matt's score, minus the mean over the standard deviation. Well, what we don't know is the mean and standard deviation of this data, but we don't actually have to compute the z-scores. Uh, this right here is going to give us enough information to answer this question. Uh, clearly, we know since Jane is a higher percentile ranking, she's going to have a higher z-score. Uh, one thing to keep in mind if you want to visualize this on a standard normal curve, the 50th percentile is right here. So we know that Matt is sitting right there. Jane's at the 85th percentile, which means for her that she's going to be sitting about right here, meaning 85% of the people are below her. Uh, so clearly, if you were to compute a z-score, Matt's z-score is zero. He is right at the median. Jane's z-score is going to be some positive value. We don't know exactly what, but we can tell by this distribution that Jane has a better z-score. Number 12. The Armour reports that the distribution of head circumference among male soldiers is approximately normal with a mean of 22.8 inches and a standard deviation of 1.1 inches. Question A. A male soldier whose head circumference is 23.9 inches would be at what percentile? Show your method clearly. Again, because we know it's approximately normal, I'm going to start by just sketching the approximate normal curve, which is right here. One thing that they've told us is that that mean is at 22.8, so I can put that as our mean. Um, this soldier here has a head circumference of 23.9, so somewhere maybe right there. They want to know the percentile, so the percentile is what percent of people are below them. So we, so basically, we just want to find uh, the area under the curve will actually give us that percentile ranking. By the way, we can clearly tell it's going to be above 50% because, 
because they're past the mean of 22.8. So let's go ahead and just compute the z-score for this. Again, z-score, piece of data, minus the mean over standard deviation. Our soldier has a 23.9. Uh, the mean of our group is 22.8 over 1.1. Uh, this would give us a z-score of actually 1.0. So there's two different ways that we can compute this. We're going to use normal CDF for both methods, but you can decide what numbers you want to put in there. And I like to show you both of these because it doesn't really matter. Um, you can kind of go with the problem depending on what they give you. If we use the z-score, we know that this same spot is a z-score of 1.0. So what we want is we want anything lower. So we're going to go from negative 999 to a positive 1.0, and for z-scores, the mean is 0, standard deviation is 1. So you can type that into your calculator. Or if you don't want to find the z-score at all, we could have done the same thing. I'm just going to abbreviate normal CDF here. We could use the actual data. We could go negative 999 from 23.9, and then use the actual mean. We would just type in 22.8 and the actual standard deviation of 1.1. Both of these calculations will give us the exact same answer. One is just using standardized data and one is using the raw data. The answer here is then going to give us an 84%. And that, therefore, that is his percentile ranking. Part B. The Army's helmet supplier regularly stocks helmets that fit male soldiers with head circumferences between 20 and 26 inches. Anyone with a head circumference outside that interval requires requires a customized helmet order. What percent of male soldiers require uh, custom helmets show you work with a well-labeled normal curve? So let's go ahead and get started and just sketch the normal curve. Again, we know that the mean, if we want to put that in here, was 22.8. Well, what they want us to find is anything outside of the range of 20 and outside of the range of 26. So if we color in our curve, what we're actually looking for is this tail and this tail. Now there's going to be a couple ways that you can do this. You can either find the individual probability of this tail and add the individual probability of this tail, or you could find the area in between here in yellow and subtract that from 1, which represents 100%. I'm actually going to find the yellow region, just a little bit less work, and I'm just going to go ahead and do a normal CDF for here. And I'm going to keep it as the raw data, so normal CDF, and let's go between 20, 26, type in our mean of 22.8, standard deviation of 1.1. This is actually going to give us an area of 0.9928. So those are the people within the range. Therefore, we can easily find those outside of the range. Let's just take 1 minus that, to that number that we got. This is actually going to give us the area of the two green tails, 0 0.0072. So that is going to be a 0.72% that are outside of the range in any customized helmets. Part C. Find the interquartile range for the distribution of head circumference among male soldiers. Okay, I'm going to sketch a curve for this one too. And we need to remember what interquartile range represents. It represents... Q3 minus Q1. So our mean here, because it's standard normal, is that this is where the 50th percentile sits, right? So we are looking for at the 25th percentile, and I'm going to show it right there. And what I'm going to do, because if this is uh, Q1, I'll just label that, that's my Q1, and let's label this guy as Q3. Here's what I know. If this is Q1, 25% of the data sits there. If this is Q3, 25% of the data sits there. So that's what we do know about the area under the curve. Okay, And this may not be drawn to scale, but you get the gist. Now the one thing about the Q1 and the Q3, because it is standard normal, we have this nice symmetry. So whatever uh, we get for this number here, for Q1, let's say we, we're going to get a negative number, because we have to get a negative number. Uh, keep in mind, uh, all we're going to know is we're taking quartiles. I'm going to do standard normal. Uh, the mean of a standard normal distribution is zero. So we know the z-score sits at zero right here. Um, I want to know what is the z-score right here and what is the z-score right here. But I also could do it in terms of not z-scores. So what you see, what I wrote down here in the green, 
I could also think about it in terms of the actual data because they really want to know the actual IQR. So what I know is that the mean, this is 22.8. I want to know what is this number and what is this number such that it's the actual Q1 and Q3. So I'm going to go and use the raw data and I'm going to ignore the z-score concept right now because that sounds like it's more work. I could, again, I know the z-score here is zero. I could find this z-score and this z-score, but then I'd have to convert them and find the raw scores. Why don't I just go ahead and say, wait a second, I know standard normal z-score of zero has the mean of 22.8. Let's just convert what this would be. So to do it, what I would do is do inverse norm. Let's do inverse norm here. So if I do inverse norm, because I want to know the actual value, not the area under the curve, so inverse norm, uh, the area I have is 0.25 for quartile 1. I know that the mean is 22.8, and I know that the standard deviation is 1.1. If you do this, what you're going to get is going to be 22.063. So now the next option we have to find quartile 3 is a couple things. We could either look at the distance between our mean and quartile 1 and notice the difference and then just tack that onto here to get quartile 3 because it's going to be the same distance here and here. Or we can just do inverse norm, redo that, <clears throat> and here's what I'm going to do this time. Instead of doing 25%, we actually want 75% of the curve. So if I come in, in here and change this to 75% of the curve because that would give me this area, it will give me that value, which is going to be 23.537. So what we have here is our quartile 1 is this guy here, and this is quartile 3. Now, what's the question? They didn't ask you for quartile 1 and quartile 3. They actually want the interquartile range. So what you need to do is compute that to get full credit. So let's do Q3 minus Q1. Your interquartile range is going to be 1.47 as the final answer. Number 13, a study recorded the amount of oil recovered from the 64 wells in an oil field. Here are the descriptive stats for the set of data from Minitab. So by the way, we can tell here N stands for count. We have 64, there's our mean, median, standard deviation, all the good stuff. Does the amount of oil recovered from all wells in this field seem to follow a normal distribution? given appropriate statistical evidence to support your answer. Now, at first glance, what my gut says to do is this, and just kind of listen to it, because it actually isn't going to work, is I know if I look at a standard normal curve, right, we know the mean here is, what do we have, 48.25, and it's approximately normal. We think, we don't know if it's approximately normal, if it is. We know that if we go one standard deviation from the mean in both directions, Right? We've already talked about, we know that there's 68% of the data sits there. Okay? Um, if we go two standard deviations and three standard deviations, remember two standard deviations and three standard deviations, uh, what we said then is that at two standard deviations, we would expect about 95%. And then at three, we're going to have 99.7%. That's called the empirical rule. So my gut was, is thinking, well, shoot, let's just do that. Let's just go one standard deviation and count and see if there's 68% of the data from there. The only flaw with this approach is I do not have all of the raw data in front of me. Um, I could easily compute uh, one standard deviation uh, from both sides. Again, let me just show you this. If I did, I would do uh, the mean is 48.25 plus or minus one standard deviation of 40.24. And this could give me a reasonable range. What you would get, by the way, would be from 8.01, and our range is then going to go on the high end to 88.49. So if I can show that 68% of the data sits in this range, I can look at this one and then I can move on to the next two. But I don't have the data, so that's the problem. So this approach, I actually have to scrap and find a different method. And it just doesn't work for this particular problem. Now, another method that would have been good is, what if I just look at the graph? Hey, great, let's look at the histogram of all 64 pieces of data and see if it looks like it's a standard normal shape. 
But again, I don't have the data, so I have to scrap that method. So I have two methods, trying the empirical rule, can't use it. Looking at the graph and making a graph, can't use it. Another option, let's look at the normal probability plot. Remember, if the normal probability plot shows kind of a linear pattern, I could say, yeah, it's approximately normal. And remember, the normal probability plot just shows all the z-scores for all 64 pieces of data. But again, it's for all 64 pieces of data. So it's just not working for me. So I have to think of another method. If you look at this that they've given us statistics, there is another approach we could take. Really, our only other approach and the best approach is to look at the relationship between the mean and the median and decide from there. So here's what we know. If the mean is approximately equal to the median, we're going to have fairly symmetric distribution, right? Now, if the mean is larger than the median, what that's going to tell us is there's going to be some outliers on the right-hand side pulling this thing to the right. And what that's going to do is cause the tail to go to the right, so we call that skewed right. Okay. Other direction, what if the mean is less than the median? If the mean is less than the median, what's happening here is outliers are on this side pulling the tail out to the left, and we call that skewed left. So if we look at the numbers that we have in this scenario, our mean here is 48.25, our median is 37.8. Clearly, this is the relationship that we have. So to justify this, what you would want to say, and use the numbers here, is you would say that the mean of 48.25 is larger than the median of 37.8. Therefore, the distribution is being skewed to the right. And that's really the best answer we can give. Now, I'll tell you, the only issue I kind of still have with this problem is I don't even know, is this thing unimodal? Is the graph bimodal? Is it trimodal? Are there various humps in it so it wouldn't even be normally distributed at all or skewed right? And maybe it's a different complete shape. But to the best of our knowledge, since we don't have the data, is we are seeing it could be skewed right. Now, let me justify it with one other thing. There's something else we can compute. We can look at the relationship between the median and the min. If you look at the median and the min, we would expect, if this was symmetric, that 50% of the data would sit there if it was symmetric, right? And then what about the difference between the median and the max? Well, if it was symmetric, you would expect 50%. Okay, well, we think it's skewed right. So a quick sketch of skewed right would be something like this. And if that's the case, we know that our median is going to be sitting more in here. So if it's skewed right um, from the median on up to the max, we should expect higher than 50% of the data. And because of that, from the min to the median, we should expect less than 50% of the data. So what we could do is we could actually compute the normal CDF. So this is actually a really smart thing to do right here. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna come on in here and do a normal CDF calc. I'm just gonna abbreviate normal CDF. From the min to quartile, or to the median, so the min was 2, the median was 37.80. Now the mean in my distribution we know again is the 48, what, 0.25, and then our standard deviation is 40.24. If you calculate the area under the curve from the min to the median, you're going to get 35.8% which represents the smaller section, okay? Let me tell you this, here's what's interesting. What if you do and find normal CDF, right, from our median to our max? If you do the same thing, but we're just gonna change these values to be median and max, uh, lo and behold, what you're gonna find is there is 60.24% of the curve sits on the right-hand side, therefore we can justify uh, that it would be skewed right. Again, I still don't know exactly if it's unimodal or bimodal, but there is some of that skewness going on.